More than ever, the kitchen is the heart of the home. And more than ever, it is a design obsession. According to one study, half of Americans plan to undertake a home renovation this year, and many of those will involve kitchens. The average kitchen renovation costs $26,000. But as we all know, plenty of new kitchens cost far more, hundreds of thousands of dollars and up. And the range of style options homeowners are lusting after has hugely expanded. From the ever-popular farmhouse look to futuristic kitchens that are as sleek, shiny, and expensive as a sports car, to funky retreats layered with colors and patterns that could have come straight from a British country house with a thatched roof. Appliance and fixture and cabinetry companies are all responding to our kitchen obsessions with the seemingly endless array of new products. And that's not even mentioning the rage for elaborate outdoor kitchens. So how do we make sense of kitchen design today? I have with me three experts who literally have seen it all and know what counts when it comes to crafting a kitchen that not only functions brilliantly, but makes homeowners happy. In 1978, Barbara Salek co-founded Waterworks, the premier luxury brand of kitchen and bath fittings, fixtures, and accessories for their husband, Robert. In the process, she practically reinvented the way Americans think about their kitchens and baths. She serves as a company's senior vice president of design and is the author of Waterworks, Inventing Bath Style, The Perfect Bath, The Perfect Kitchen, and most recently, The Ultimate Bath. Welcome, Barbara. Hi, Michael. Matthew Quinn is a principal of the Atlanta-based Design Galleria Kitchen and Bath Studio and is the founder of Matthew Quinn Collection, a luxury showroom that blends the best of today's products with his own expanding lines of kitchen bath, and closet designs. In 2016, he published Quintessential Kitchens, Volume 1, and then followed up with Quintessential Kitchens and Spaces, Volume 2, in 2019. An expert in kitchen, bath, and product design, Matthew has collaborated with top architects and interior designers on kitchens and baths for residential, commercial, and hospitality projects around the world. Hello, Matthew. Hi, Michael. Good to see you. So glad you're here. Sophie Donaldson is the former editor-in-chief of House Beautiful magazine. Now based in Montreal, she serves as a brand consultant and is the contributing editor for Business of Home and an advisor for apartment therapy. She's the author of House Beautiful, Style Secrets, What Every Room Needs, and Abrams has just published her newest book, Uncommon Kitchens, a revolutionary approach to the most popular room in the house. Welcome, Sophie. Hey, Michael. So I'm so pleased to have such a distinguished array of experts here on something, a room I think that probably has evolved more than any other room in the house in the past 75 years. And Barbara, I'd love to get started with you because you really, I, I mean, I can't tell you the number of hours I've spent looking in the waterworks showroom windows, exploring in there, dreaming, you know, all of my kitchen and bath renovations have involved some waterworks projects. So how how did you realize that this was an untapped tap market and how did you really reach out and expand our obsessions with the kitchen? So I'm going to start by saying, uh, like all entrepreneurs, you get lucky once in a while, right? <laughs> Hopefully. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. And And we just were able to see that this was a space that was ripe for something to happen. I think everyone was sick of avocado and pink and maroon and colonial blue or whatever it was. And we were able to tap into that mainly because we had traveled to Germany and saw things that were absolutely not available here in the United States. So we took every resource we had and borrowed a huge amount of money from the bank at 22%, I might add. Whoa. And yes. We think and, we have inflation now. <laughs> exactly. And we staked our lives on it, honestly, our kids' education, our house, everything else. And and just the the there was a single pivotal moment that changed everything. And that's when my husband looked at me one day and decided 
that he thought he could save our marriage, which I guess he did uh, <laughs> decades later, and um, save our business and decided to give everything that we had in our inventory that was colored, sinks, toilets, tubs, whatever, and we were going to sell only white. And it's, it changed the bath industry, it changed our lives, and it continues. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, what's interesting to me, Matthew, is when, when it used to be that the kitchen was a back area. You know, if you had staff, they would be in the back. But the kitchen was something that was, the idea was to make it efficient so that housewives wouldn't have to spend meant much time in the kitchen. The idea was to get out of the kitchen, you know, convenience, you know, TV dinners, anything that kept women out of the kitchen was considered an improvement. And now the whole family's in the kitchen. And I, I would love to get a sense from you how your clients are thinking about their kitchens now. Is it still considered a luxury space? Is it still considered a family space? Well, I mean, I think COVID had a lot to do with this. I think it confirmed that this is the hub of all activity in the house. This is where everyone gathers and, uh, you know, in the 90s, we used to do this. It's like the kitchen came out of the back and it, we kind of were doing all these show kitchens where spaces that you, they were too delicate, they were too pretty to use. And we had these back kitchens and, you know, your homeowner would be using the back kitchen and never see the rest of their family because the show kitchen wasn't allowed to be used. But what's interesting is now you have these back kitchens, but they are incredibly important and a huge accessory to the main kitchen. So both spaces are being used. And you almost need that now with all the extra gadgets, all the, you know, there's additional people cooking now. So, and I think COVID kind of really changed that. So, you know, 95% of our projects now have what we call a working pantry or a mess kitchen, a back kitchen. We sometimes call them electric rooms because they have a countertop that is just full of appliances all plugged in and ready to use, but you can't see it from the main kitchen. You know, so these are these, it's fun to do these back spaces. Um, it's really important to integrate them so somebody doesn't feel isolated back there. There's big windows or large openings, pocket doors, things like that to kind of connect that to the other space. But um it's it's basically you're designing two kitchens though. Um, wow. So in other words, the kitchen, the main kitchen came out of the back, became part of the main part of the house, and now it's re re um, colonized the back again. So the it has, kitchens are expanding. Right. right. And it, and I kind of think of it as, and we have typically more fun in the back kitchen, um, a little bit more color, a little bit more pattern. You, the surfaces tend to be a little more durable back there, but kind of consider it like the powder room of the kitchen. You're a little more daring in that back space and the front space is a little more integrated to the architecture of the design of the uh, entire house. Now, speaking house. of being a little more daring, so for your your wonderful new book, which I had the pleasure of reading, uh, really advocates that not only is the kitchen more central, but it's sort of been neglected in terms of style and that there's lots of ways to make the kitchen more integral to the style of the house. So t tell me a little about how the, your this book evolved. Like what first made you realize the kitchens really have the potential to become something different? Yeah, I actually, to your, to your point, um, it's actually that there was too much emphasis on the style in the kitchen, that the, that the weight of kitchen decisions, that the expense that we were doing, that kind of the kitchen renovation as this is this huge idea, something that people, you know, saved up for, they dreamed about, they enacted it. It took over their lives when they started it. it you know, it's sort of, you know, it's a vacuum. It takes, it takes us all in if you're doing a kitchen renovation. Um, all that started to feel really heavy to me. And it started to feel really different than how we treat the rest of the rooms in our home. That basically in the bedroom, you can get a new comforter and shush things up. You can change the way your mantle is arranged or the furniture arrangement of the living room without buying anything. But in the kitchen, it was like, you know, new countertop, new appliances or bust. People just had this incredibly kind of polar way of thinking about the kitchen. And I think it sucked a lot of the fun out of it. I think that um, a lot of us, you know, not us in the trade, but the people out there that are passionate about design really started to understand how to put together the rest of the house. You know, Michael, we've been <laughs> writing versions yeah. of the same thing for yeah, 20, yeah. 30, knows we've been trying 30 to instruct years them, so now. <laughs> but, it, but it, it's working and, and design media 
you know, people are savvy. They understand how to mix. They're mixing high and low. They're shopping all over. They're integrating antiques. They know to hang art. They know to buy flowers. Like there's a lot of kind of connective, you know, collective knowledge about how we design homes and the kitchen felt left out from that. It felt like I have to hire a designer. I have to spend a lot of money. There seemed to be a lot of shoulds and have tos. And I really want to liberate people from that. That's great. Because Barbara, it seems as to me that, you know, there we have seen evolution in the style of living rooms and, and dining rooms, all of that, you know, dining rooms, the library, um, bedrooms, but the kitchen seems to me has been undergone so many different styles in the last 50 years. I mean, I remember, you know, farmhouse kitchen is hugely popular at the moment, but I, there was that period in the eighties with very, you know, Christopher Peacock, elaborate cabinetry, sort of neo um, classical cabinetry in the kitchen. We saw, um, you know, as I was saying, the very minimalist Italian ones of Bofi and uh, Pogan Pole and those kind of things where it was all sleek and which is still very popular, but it seems as if th this idea of the kitchen has, is a style um, I guess as style um, sensitive as any other room in the house. And why do you think that is? And how have you responded in terms of waterworks? So I think you're quite right. But I think the thing that liberates us all is the fact that the kitchen isn't really separate from the rest of the house anymore. So all of a sudden, I think you need to bring the kitchen into the dining room, into the living room, and into all of the adjacencies. So it isn't like this standalone thing, but it is the hardest working room of the house. There is no question about that, partly because we've all been liberated by technology. So it's no longer the kitchen, even though we all are food centric. It's the media room. It's the telephone room. The it's all room. of these other spaces. And it's also where you need to put stuff away. So you can never kind of walk yourself away from cabinetry. You know, for years and years, we sold kitchen sinks and kitchen faucets. And we always toyed with the idea of what to do about the kitchen cabinets. And we finally decided that we had a voice and we were going to say something about kitchen cabinetry, but we wanted it to look like the cabinetry that was in the rest of the house. We didn't want it to look like another shaker styled kitchen. So I think time just keeps evolving and we keep thinking about the kitchen in different ways, the same way that we continue to think about the bath as opposed to a functional space, as a retreat, as a place to relax, as a place for pampering. So you know, I think as you begin to integrate all the rooms into the house, it isn't just the kitchen that needs to stand alone. Matthew, um, certainly, you know, you are an exemplar of, of kitchen design and kitchen efficiency. And it used to be, I remember, you know, there was a, you had to plot out the triangle between the sink, the refrigerator, the stove, you know, it was a, there were very precise rules that people were told that for their kitchen to work efficiently, it had, they had to follow these rules. It seems like those have all been thrown out. Um, how, how do people think about their kitchens differently now? What do they come to asking for? Do they, I mean, clearly open kitchens have changed the way we think of it, as, as Barbara was saying, and, you know, practically every new development in Manhattan, at least high-end apartments, no matter how expensive they are, have a big open kitchen that's very close to the, the main living area. But how do people think about their kitchen in terms of, because as we know, many of these people who have expensive kitchens don't even cook. Um, but what do they want it to look like? How do they want to interact with their kitchens? Well, you know, that I'd say that used to be the case where most people don't cook, but COVID did change that. I mean, That's people true. were More almost people forced to use I'm their kitchen. So I, I can guarantee you I've been to kitchens that I've done 10, 12 years later and the instructions are still in the ovens, you know, but <laughs> that's just not, it's, it's crazy, but it's not the case anymore. I mean, it, and people were kind of forced to cook their kitchen. Some of them left um, COVID very proud that they were able to provide the nourishment to their family and were something they were kind of intimidated about as far as cooking and really learned to learn to cook and actually quite loved it. And they, some, some of my new projects that, you know, homeowners realized that their kitchen actually worked against them. Um, the, the function of it, the layout of it worked against them instead of for them. So I'm 
what I really love doing is saving time. There's nothing more than like designing a great kitchen that functions well and delivers time back to that family. Um, so they can spend it in another way than, you know, putting up dishwashers, dishes and uh, prepping and that type of thing and spending time together. So there are so many variables. Yes, the work triangle. I mean, forget about it. Even when I taught school, I told I taught it for one class and then told them how to break all the rules the second class. So um, it's it's there's just so many variables, just like vegan, gluten free. I mean, you know, j- just like a menu at a restaurant, it's the same thing. So everyone cooks and preps differently. What they prepare is different, requires different function, how many people are in there, the size of the people in the space, um, of course, the size of the space. If Are they type A? You know, Do they not want to see anything at all and everything is, is put away? Do we have a space for a back kitchen? You know, It's always funny. My clients are always, one of the first things I do is say, I want to see your closet. I want to see what you wear, what you put on your body every day. And, and part of that is that style that Barbara was talking about. So Yes, this is a room that is permanently attached to the architecture of the home, but nowadays people are not being as cautious as they were where it's got to be very vanilla. They are loving inserting their style into it. Very similar to the ideas that Sophie has in her book with color and fabrics and things that are easily changed, um, inserting that style into it. And realtors are telling you too that the houses are selling better if they do have personality attached to them versus just the same look all the way down the street, you finally have one that has some color inserted to it. It it has some status to it. It has some fun to it. It makes you happy. I think that's kind of the sea change uh, that we can agree on, which is that, you know, it used to be okay to kind of assert that personality in, in certain rooms of the house. But the kitchen, it was like, you know, there's just some things that make sense. There's just some hard and fast rules. There's just, this is just what's right. Um, and I don't think anybody in this room, you know, agrees with that anymore. There isn't a one size fits all for anyone. And all of us have roles in which we're able to present, you know, different ideas when it comes to having a designer, you know, that's kind of the point. It's somebody to reflect back to you like a therapist. Here's what you're telling me. You know, you're telling me this, but I see this let's reconcile. You know, there's a, there's a voice and there's a way to bounce off when people are going it alone or they're directly going to a contractor. um, It requires a lot of self-knowledge. And that is something that not everybody has about the kitchen because I think it's tied up with so much fear. There's so much fear about making a poor choice or choice that's going to be dated or something that's going to keep your house from being resellable. And this is something we really haven't gotten over since the housing crash. I mean, it's been nearly 20 years and people are still saying, oh, I love lavender and that marble is so cool, but like, you know, let's be honest, I'm just going to go with this, you know? And, and I, and I, you know, if you do that, I, you know, I would say, okay, then you're going to need a lot of colorful cloths around. And if you have the liberty to do something that suits you, that will make you happy in reality, we're just not flipping houses like we used to. And I don't think people want to, I think people understand kind of the waste and the exhaustion and the time and the money that goes into that. Um, And that that time could be better used, yeah, in your kitchen, hanging out with your family. You know, Lee Mandel, I was just going to say that Lee Mandel talked about a faucet as being humanistic. Like everything you touch has to feel really good in your hands, like your most comfortable sweater. You know, it's pleasing to your eye. It feels good. You like to touch it and it only gets better with age. And that's kind of the way I like to think about a kitchen too, that, that that's a great way to make sure that down the road, you're going to say to yourself, wow, that feels good in my hands. They've grown arthritic, but it still feels good. <laughs> well, it's interesting. It seems like the by, by word has gone from efficiency in the kitchen to comfort and, and pleasure, which is, I think, a big step ahead. But one of the things that interests me, and this is so evident in your book, Sophie, is, Barbara, you were talking about color. You know, your big revolution was to go, go to all white. Now you see kitchens, I mean, the cabinetry could be like a teal blue and the oven is red. And which is such a, a switch from like 10 years ago where everything, you want all the appliances hidden behind panels. So they blended in. You didn't even know there was a refrigerator or a dishwasher there. Now it's like these are elements of design that you can play with. And I thought that was so interesting. So Matthew, have you seen that a more openness to that kind of thing with your clients that people are wanting to be more playful, even though the stove could cost $30,000 or they'll get want a smeg retro looking refrigerator as opposed to, you know, behind a sleek 
wood grain panel that blends in with the rest of the cabinetry. Uh, absolutely. Color. I mean, definitely that back kitchen. It is always kind of, I encourage wild colors back there and then inserting colors um, uh, into the main kitchen. Certainly, I mean, that $30,000 range is not 30000 anymore. It's 80000 Okay, so, but I stand corrected. And, and, <laughs> it's been a while. Right? <laughs> yeah. And selecting a color is the most difficult part of that, you know, is figuring out that color. I was going to say when we were talking about this, the, the pressure, I currently have four legacy projects happening, two in Florida, one in New York, and one in Dallas, where these are homes that are, you know, well above $100 million, and they want these, the parents are building it, they're their parents eventually may move in and their children are young and they want their children to grow up, keep this house, move into this house. So the pressure of making kind of uh, decisions, not only from a function standpoint, but from a finish standpoint too, is, uh, you know, is daunting. Um, but at the same time, we're making those decisions knowing that there's no way we're going to be able to select a waterworks faucet that every generation from here in the next 200 years is going to love. Um, but let's certainly, the faucet is something that can easily be changed. So let's, let's pick a fabulous classic faucet that'll last 50 years. That's the part that interests me so much is when I talk to design professionals, which is, you know, what are the ways that this room can become more iterative and more flexible? Because like I said, we see that in other parts of the house and the kitchen just has these you know, I always say they're like boxy, they're clunky, they're expensive. It's like a series of rectangles and cubes that are sort of modular, they move around, and then we're sort of, you know, designing around them. And the question is like, how much of that, you know, is flexible? Are, you know, if you go with, you know, a certain finish or, you know, real wood cabinets, like, can they and would they be repainted? You know, it's a shaker style, you know, Um, profile. So it's something that's like quite livable. Um, You can even paint the insets. You can, you know, we've just seen at Kipps Bay, like a, you know, a beautiful edition of a a kitchen that had, you know, a gorgeous calico wallpaper as an inset, like a scenic in there and, and just a lot of different ideas to, to play with. And that, that to me is interesting. And it's what's interesting about like an unfitted kitchen and, and Barbara in your bath book, this is a really good example. Bath has a little bit more fun. Once you have a freestanding tub, it like, it becomes more room. Like you're, you're playing with these elements, you're playing with shapes and it's just, it's a little bit more freeing. And I, I love that idea for the kitchen. And Matthew, you've done kitchen furniture in a lot of your projects where, you know, there's levity there. There's, you know, there's air and space at, you know, either the kick plate or under a work table or an island. It doesn't feel like what I always call like the bodysuit of design. Not everything has to be connected and seamless and sort of, to me, what feels a little bit stiff. It feels a little like wearing kind of like a matching pantsuit when you see another person <laughs> wearing cool coordinates or like, you know, a vintage jacket over a nice, you know, pair of pants and a blouse. And it looks kind of playful and free and unforced. Some of these kitchens that I see, the kind of the more they're perfected, the more they're kind of, it just, it, it feels dated in that way that perfection can feel where you're like, I really know where this came from. And, and it, it doesn't, you're not like, oh, wow, is this old or is this new? Or where did this come from? Or how did this come about? You know, I love that idea. Well, it's so interesting. I mean, I get the sense now that nobody wants their kitchen to look like a laboratory, you know, and which is what, and it, it, at least according to the Wall Street Journal, the style that you were t- just mentioning, Sophie, the hot style of the moment is sort of the kitchen uh, as a conglomeration of furniture, whether it is all ordered together, you know, there's that company Plain English, which is having a moment. Everybody's, you know, with the rich colors and the, and the individual pieces that fit together, whether they're painted the same color or a different color. And that seems to be much more of the moment. And I, I wonder if that's just a reflection, maybe Matthew, what you were saying about, you know, COVID, you wanted to make the kitchen a place where the family hangs out more. And this is more comfortable than hanging out in a lab, you know, where everything is cold and, you know, lacquered or steel or whatever. So do you think that that, that, the, that, the pandemic had an effect on that as well, Matthew? Well, I think, I mean, it, it. you have the personality of the entire family now. So, you know, and everyone wants their, wants their voice heard in the space. They're going to be using this space. So everybody's going to have different colors that they love and um, different styles. So it's, it's kind of blending all of that um, in, in, into that space. And I absolutely still have clients that want laboratories because their personalities are like laboratories and cold and sterile. So that's what they get. That's what they want. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Let's but, go out for a drink with them. <laughs> <laughs> burn. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think the hardest part about doing a kitchen is that we all get kind of stuck on the design and the triangle that isn't a triangle anymore. And we forget that it should be about, you know, creating memories, creating an experience, thinking about intimacy, elements that are so much harder to build into a space than functionality. I, I I would ask Matthew and you, Barbara, as well, like if there are ways to design for that, because one thing that I, I find and I'm writing about it right now is this, you know, I'm calling the essay, like, are we loving our kitchens to death? That there is this idea that we want so much kit, like we love the kitchen so much. We want so much kitchen. So we make it huge. And then guess what? You've lost the intimacy of the space. Like, and if you're working with a designer, they might say, listen, let's bring the lights down lower. Like if we're going to be around the island. Also, you don't need eight bar stools. In fact, four is enough and it's okay to lean and it's okay to pull a chair up and it's okay to just sort of work with the room. And, and that's what feels intimate is the exchange of people accommodating other people and that the kind of the bigger they get. And so anyway, I, I guess I throw that as a question, if you don't mind my asking, Michael, to you guys, which is like, how do you design for, um, yeah, the eventual hope of like of feeling and memory? Because I find that the second you're like, I have a ton of family, I want to make room for everybody, yeah. you've lost the-, the <laughs> Yeah, talk about the you've triangle. You've run a marathon. Just, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I want to design islands that there's no other space in the house to do com uh, homework more comfortably than right there at the island with you know, a parent cooking for them. So they have all the tools right there, the chargers, all the whatever they need is all right there at the island and it's a comfortable space. And then they can get up from the, leave their homework there, dinner's ready, and they go and sit down at a, ta a, you know, a table nearby. It can be as simple as you know, refrigerator drawers, totally dedicated. There's whatever is in that drawer, a child can have at any time. So it's healthy snacks, yogurts, apples, whatever. But those are their drawers. So again, kind of forcing that interaction for the space, not putting, I mean, some, something as simple as unloading the dishwasher and making sure that the dishes aren't up in wall cabinets, they're in drawers, things like that get the children more inter, interacted and in, into the process of cooking. I have a social corner sink. I mean, I designed a corner sink for an island specifically for a parent and a child to be able to be at 90 degrees from each other and have a conversation while they're prepping a meal together. So it's called, it literally is called the social corner because of that. So I, I completely agree with um, Sophie that it, if they get too big, you lose that. And I focus so much on like seconds of time giving back to that family, letting them do, I mean, it, it, it's kind of mind blowing when you really, if you, if you plan a kitchen out well, the amount of minutes you can save, you times those minutes by weeks, by months, you can save two and three days of time. Wouldn't, I'd much rather they go on vacation because I did a good job, you know, mm -hmm. create doing a layout for their kitchen than spending the that. time going back and forth. I learned that from you, Matthew, about, you know, kind of just making it accessible for the kids. And I've shared that with so many, so many friends. <laughs> I, you know, I'm the type to like enlist, you know, my my kids' friends when they're over at the house, I'm like, okay, well, good. There's two more hands so to do the dishwasher, <laughs> and they're and you know, I mean, the amount of kids are like, I've never done this before. Or like, my mom or my housekeeper says I don't do it right, and I'm like, right. well, over here you're gonna. And then I tell the mom, I'm like, I'm like, hey, you know, Thomas is totally capable of doing the dishwasher. He, you know, we talked about it, and she was like almost you know sheepish and embarrassed, right? But but yeah, having a drawer, um, or even right, if you don't have a refrigerator drawer, like having the door of the fridge, the lowest parts be accessible, you know, for children and like. Likewise, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that work um, for other stages of life that we design for children. And we've seen this, of course, in baths where you use high grout ratio, right, to make sure it's not slippable for somebody that, you know, is either learning to walk or struggling with walking um, in the later parts of their life. Um, but yeah, there's great tips there. And it's, it's not, you know, I love anything that's not just for a renovator, right, that somebody can implement right away uh, into their home. So I'll speak up for the elderly to say that, <laughs> to be honest, to have a smaller kitchen um, is really a very efficient thing as one grows older with lots of ability to reach and, and touch um, makes a huge difference for sure. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too, I think, and Sophie, you make this point so well in, in your book, 
I think a lot of times people think they need to have the latest, the greatest, whatever. Uh, and like Sophie points out, maybe you don't even need an island. Maybe a kitchen table will will suffice. You know, it's like, but I think people get, you know, oh, I have to have a wine cooler. I have to have, the, you know, plate heating, whatever. You know, and God knows, the, you know, the appliance companies all, you know, merchandise this stuff and they make it, they do it in these beautiful ads that makes you think, oh, I need to have this. I need to have that. But maybe we don't need all of that stuff. Um, and the other thing that I loved in Sophie's book that really surprised me, because we have so much lighting and pendant lighting and everything, you know, it's many of the kitchens have table lamps. I don't think I'd ever seen a kitchen with a table lamp in it before. And I think, oh, you know, what a great idea, if you, especially if you have a little bit of counter space. You know, it just makes it more homey. And I just, I, I, do you think people are more open to that now, Matthew? Are, are your clients thinking they don't need to have, you know, the whole Italian looking low slung thing. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing, I love table lamps on an Island immediately takes it from something, you know, that's in a kitchen to a table, to a piece of furniture. It's, it's such a great look actually gives great light. If you pick the right lamp. Um, Yeah. It's a fantastic look. And, and, I love that Sophie had celebrated it so much in her book. The, even the wrong lamp works, you know. I mean, it's, <laughs> and also, guess what? You can just remove it. That's right. <laughs> it's yeah, like, exactly. I'm plugging it. It's done. You know, you know? it's kind right. of it, that's how I feel about you know rugs in the kitchen. People are you know skeeved out, and I, I get that camp, and then sometimes I like it, and then I roll it up, and I you know put it out on the deck to air out. You know, it's like these. I I, I love the tussling with the house. You know, it's like I remember Charlotte Moss talking about sort of a Saturday morning, you know, for her once. And, and she was sort of like just doing house, like moving things around, moving plants, you know, changing, a, you know, a comforter or a set of, you know, sheets into something different, just like playing with it. And it is something that the pandemic gave us is that people were all of a sudden in their homes for more time. They had more opinions. They were able to see things in a different way. They got frustrated. Maybe they had friction more than they would have. And so they start to to do it. And so I, yeah, I love those parts and especially for the kitchen, which again, it feels rigid and like that wouldn't happen, but there's no reason that art or plants or lamps or all of that. I think we're a little way away from the lamps on the counter though. I can remember we designed one and I, we were so proud of ourselves and we had a really cool name for it and we sold three. And I, oh, <laughs> well, that's the thing. You can be too, idea. you can be too far ahead of the curve. God ahead knows. Curve. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so which raises another question. I'd love to know, because if you're doing a kitchen renovation or you, you know, you're having a builder building your house and you, you're thinking about what you want in your kitchen, now I and God knows we're all susceptible to trends and whatever's fashionable. You that you, so Matthew, I'll start with you. What do you think is next? Going to be the next thing that people want? Is it color? I mean, you know, in Sophie's book, there's lots of kitchens and colors that you would never think of as kitchen colors, um, which I think is so great. But is it? Are the? Is it some sort of you know wine thing? You know, I know wine rooms are so popular, but what's the dream item of the future? Of, uh, moving ahead if it's not table lamps. I mean, a lot of it is based on, you know, a lot of even vacations now, they're somehow related to kitchens, either Airbnbs or hotels have cooking experiences. So those are the kinds of things that I kind of extract that information from my client, their likes and desires of what they kind of want the space to work. Kind of like the baths, you know, it's, it's always back to hotel rooms as far as bath design goes. So very similar, yes, color, yes, personality. Um, I do find people are wanting to store a lot more wine. That's a COVID uh, situation. More wine. God knows I drank more wine during COVID. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, more sinks, just because there's more than one person in there. And probably more freezer, just because they have a lot more home delivery, kind of getting used to the you know, the, uh, so it used to be not less freezer because we had more shopping for fresh food, but there's probably, there's requests for a little bit more freezer storage now just because of deliveries, but, um, more windows, no wall cabinets. I think people have Marie kondo themselves down to, they've edited themselves where they don't have, you know, 20 different sets of China. They've really figured out their two or three best, um, and, you know, accommodating that and having less kind of upper storage, more place for art, more place for lighting, more place for a fun tile backsplash, that type of thing. Interesting. And 
Barbara, well, how is Waterworks planning for these changes? I mean, do you have new products in the pipeline? Or are you thinking, what, what do you look for inspiration? So inspiration, of course, is looking at the best things. You know, you're in museums and you're in people's houses and you're walking on the street. And so inspiration can come from lots of places. Our last, the last thing we um, introduced came from a horse barn. So you kind of never know where you're going to find an inspiration. But truthfully, at the moment, um, we're kind of settling in and, and letting people see what we have and how that works because nothing looks the same the minute you put a different coat of paint on it. So having a million different styles does not help people make decisions. And I think that's the thing that's really important. And I think what we like to see, and I think everybody here says the same thing, how do you layer a kitchen in much the same way that you're going to layer your living room? with pattern, with color, with art, with shapes, with interesting chairs that don't necessarily fall in the category of quote unquote kitchen chairs. So how do you just take a space that's functional and turn it into something much more meaningful and something your kids will say later on, oh my gosh, we had this great kitchen. Do you remember those chairs? And, and so I think that we're thinking about how to simply take what we have and, and find ways to use it a little differently without this sort of extraordinary effort that it takes to develop something new. Although we're developing new kitchen faucets. I mean, that's always on our right. agenda. Right. But it's interesting to me that Waterworks has brought, like a lot of the fittings have a more of a a jewelry kind of luxury, like, you know, you have guiloche, you have been colored enamel. It's like, you know, and then that's a, a small area. I mean, you know, it's the handles of a fitting, but yet it, it's what Sophie was talking about, you, the, the comfort of touching something or feeling that it's a special moment. And I, I've noticed that, and I think that's probably going to continue. What do you think, Sophie? Is that? Well, yeah, I mean, to tie all this together, I, you know, it's, Choosing your special things, right? When people go from one house, especially somebody that's maybe an empty nester, they're going from, let's say that they had their dream kitchen and now maybe they're downsizing or they're doing something else. It's like, mm -hmm. what is your must have? What is your ride or die? What is the, you know, if you need a trash compactor and that's your thing, like <laughs> go for it. You need a sparkling water tap. Okay. Yeah. You know, that it, it's again, self-knowledge, right? Like what, what is that kind of like make it or break it thing, that luxury that you're like, uh, I have to have this, you know, I think that picking that's really cool. For me, I, 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 I like the idea of being brave enough to edit, you know, you guys all touched on this, but it's like, what's the kitchen that doesn't have a range because you just don't cook like that. You know, it's, you know, what I heard a story about, you know, a gentleman who, was either hosting a crowd, you know, like a Manhattan apartment, you know, food on laps type of situation, or, you know, he was a bachelor. He was on his own. He was getting takeout. He was going out to eat, you know, eating simply, that kind of thing. And he would pull out, uh, you know, these burners, these gas burners, like, you know, almost like mm -hmm. camp stoves, a series of them, you know, two, pay, three pairs of two and whip it all up. And then they would go neatly into storage because, you know, that wasn't what his kitchen was for. He would mix drinks and get takeout. And I, I love that idea of being brave enough to say, this is how I live. This is how I cook. This is what my family needs. And this space is more important and valuable to me for this piece of art than it is for, you know, a range top that I just don't want to look at. <laughs> and so anyway, it's a, it's a very liberated way of thinking. But yeah, you can use the <laughs> Use the oven use for shoe storage, storage. like <laughs> Sex on the City, right? I mean, it's, it's like you That's adapt exactly the right. space to what you need. Um, yes. <laughs> I think it's really cool. That's really a great way to think about it. And, you know, now with, we're all having to get induction tops. I mean, those are, you can get very sleek little ones that, you know, you can store them in with your um, cutting boards, you know. That's right. Put a nice cutting board right on top of it. You don't have right. to look at it. You know, right. if, it's too, if it's too sleek for you, it's, right. uh, you don't right. have to live like right. that. Yeah, I mean that's part of that process where you're asking those questions. You know, what what are your favorite meals to cook? What do you what do you ask to cook, and what do you want to learn to cook? You know what, um, and that has a direct result over you know what type of cooking is specified in the space, what the surfaces are. I mean, we're renovating our studio here, and the conference table will have an induction cooktop under the countertop, so you don't have to see the induction yet. You can still cook on it, so it could it could be a kitchen table. 
it looks just like a table, but when you do cook, you could actually use that table to cook on. So there's, a, there's you know, it's just it, so many really fun ways to make these spaces memorable. And I, I preach that all the time to my clients. Like your, your, your 10 year old is not going to remember when they're 23, the memory of, oh, we had so much, such a great time cooking in an all white kitchen with white countertops and white walls and white tile. No, but if, if you, if we use color and we use pattern and great and super cool cushions or yellow lampshades hanging over the island, whatever, they're going to remember that. Yeah, and, and they remember the remember that. imperfection too. They remember they're what goes wrong. They remember, remember sticky drawers or using absolutely. a stool to get up to a place that didn't have a stool for them, or the fire. You know, my like smoke detector goes off because it's in a terrible place. Like <laughs> right. they'll That's remember. Exactly right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's it's it, it seems to me that the technology, the advances of the technology, like induction and all that, it really is allowing us to go back to an era. It's like we move ahead so that we can go back to the simpler pleasures and concentrate on, you know, the texture of the flour as you're making more hideous pie crust or, you know, getting the butter in there. It's like all of that stuff is to get you back to the comfort of gathering together around, you know, the hearth, so to speak, and enjoying food together, which even if it comes from Uber Eats, it's all, it's a, it's a great experience, you know, it's all fine. And, um, but I am glad to hear, Matthew, that many more people are using these super expensive kitchens that they're putting in. I think that's really <laughs> something very reassuring about that. And people are curious. Like, I, I love, you know, I love that the kitchen, I, I write about this. Um, it's one of, I think, my favorite page in the book is that how universal it is and how welcoming it is. That, like, if you're meeting a friend, a neighbor, a stranger, like, the amount of neighbors that came in during my kitchen renovation, I'm like, do you want to see the kitchen? They're like, yeah. <laughs> It's all we can think about, you know, like they were dying to come in. It's, you know, it's a stranger, but the kitchen is a place where it's just that incredibly, like it's both intimate, but welcoming. It, there's just no room like it in a, in a living room or a den or a family room or even a porch. There's a, there's a forced kind of, uh, yeah, uh, intimacy, but also can be a little stagnant in the kitchen. Like it's like everybody feels comfortable opening a cabinet to get a glass of water. Are they here? Are they here? Oh no, they're in the drawer. Oh, cool. So you put them in drawers and it's, it's this conversation starter. It's for all the change that we've gone through over, you know, decades and, and centuries, the elements are very similar. We have a source of water. We have a place to wash things. We have a place to warm up, you know, I just had friends install like a pulley made, you know, like a warming thing over, you know, their hearth in the kitchen because the kitchen was where it was warm. That's why people were there, right? It's uh, where everything, where everything happened. And back in the day, kitchens were, it's exactly what Barbara said at the beginning. It's where the communication was, where the family was, where the cooking was, where schoolwork happened. Why? Because there was a stove, <laughs> you know, and it's like, it happened there. We are exactly coming full circle to that same idea. The comfy chair wasn't an affectation. It wasn't like a British Instagram sensation. Like it was actually like women spent so much time there that they needed a place to rest while they waited for stew and laundry to dry, you know? So we are coming full circle in that. But I do think in any kitchen, the significance of a few super well-chosen details cannot be overstated. Uh, I think that's totally true. I mean, because the kitchen is more important than ever, it's more important what you put into it and what you think, you know, you really think about it. And um, you know, it's, I think there's a lot of confusing information out there. You know, people go to Home Depot, they go to Lowe's, whatever, they get overwhelmed. They, they, you know, which is, of course, what, Matthew, why you have a career, because people get overwhelmed with what to do. And, you know, you you have learned and you know, and you, you as you said, you personalize it to the client. But it, it's a ton of stuff out there because it is a huge market. And it's something that, um, you know, that's why people love Waterworks, Barbara, because they know you guys have thought about all of this stuff when you, what, what you put out in the market has really, you know, been, shall we say, road Edited tested. and curated. You're, you're road <laughs> tested, you, you know. Helping you. Uh, <laughs> totally. And I think that that's, you know, there will continue to be that confusion out there. But, you know, Sophie, as you said, we love to educate people. And I think your book does a great job. And, and just making people think differently about the kitchen. You know, it's not necessarily the white subway time. You know, like yeah, you and just have, think, just, yeah, look look yeah, around at kitchens that you, you wouldn't love. have for yourself right. and learn. Right, right. So, and, um, you know, and as part of that education is this podcast. And I want to thank you guys all for, you know, you're all so incredibly expert. Your expertise is so massive. And for you to share with our listeners has been really a wonderful thing. So I want to thank 
my wonderful guests, Barbara Salek, Matthew Quinn, and Sophie Donaldson. And thank everyone for listening to The Cherish Podcast.